people of Israel, therefore, know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all that are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And, be, and he testified with many other words and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Thank you. So powerful. So this is how we were born as a church. This is how the Holy Spirit gave birth to the first church, um, Christ pouring out his spirit on everyone gathered together. And uh, the goal of this class is for you to know that this is still happening today and that churches are being born and for you to, uh, to know that God is using you, that you have a, a huge part in this and possibly uh, I'm sure the Holy Spirit has even more ways, you know, that we can creatively be part of this. Um, so um, my, my goal is to right now, let's see, it's almost 930. I, I want to only talk about 15 minutes so that you, I want you to think about how to try this on and, and think about what parts especially inspire me to pray about um, and pray for. And if I was going to start a church and be part of starting a church today, what part would I dive into? You know, what part is, is interesting and exciting to me? So um, uh, my, my calling and my job in life is to help people give birth to churches. And I really need to say thank you that I am here. Because when you called Christian to come to Chicago to Pastor Pilgrim, uh, I came along. And um, also, thank you for that this is possible to keep happening through the resources that you share as Pilgrim. You know, whenever an offering is given at Pilgrim, a percentage goes towards the mission support to the Synod. Um, and, then, uh, and then we're a part of a national church body where a, a percentage of what offerings go to the Synod go to do ministry as a whole nation of churches. And so um, thank you. Um, and, uh, I just want to say, why do we care about there being churches and for more churches to be born? Um, and, and if you would think about why do you care about new churches being born? What does church mean to you that, that you would like other people to have this gift? Um, uh, for me personally, it goes back to being a kid. Um, I grew up in a church with a school like Pilgrim, um, and, by the age four or five, I started, I mean, I was at church so much, I, I didn't even realize at first that there were some people growing up without church. Uh, and then when I did realize that, I was like, this is the most unfair thing in the world. You know, uh, that other kids aren't just getting this constant infusion of Jesus, you know, from all these caring adults and families at the church. And, um, and the school, and my parents tried to assure me, um, oh yeah, but by the time most people are adults, they'll hear that there's a Jesus, you know, and, and I said, but, but that's not the same as getting this kind of a hug from Sunday school teachers, church members. I mean, it felt to me like a kid that it was like a party every week. And in between, every time we saw someone from church, we'd be so excited. And so, um, it, it, it still it doesn't seem fair to me, um, you know, because I, I love the, the hug that a church gives people, you know, like um, even, even people that are not in the church, like say all our kids at Pilgrim that are growing up through the school, you know, even if they're not part of the church, they know that there is a church. They're, 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 kind of, they're in the arms of a church as they're having their education and 
another group, you know, I would say it is so dear to us is the Hot Meals community. Um, and this community, even if people are not official members of the church, I would say Pilgrim is the church, you know, for um, people who come to Hot Meals on Saturdays. Um, so, uh, um, and then as a kid too, you know, um, with all the Bible stories and all the church, I realized Jesus is the greatest treasure of my life. You know, I, all this love, unstoppable, all this forgiveness and um, just, uh, I want my main thing in life to be sharing Jesus with other people and especially with anyone who doesn't already have Jesus or know Jesus or Jesus love. And so I, I was born in 1971, I'm 49. I, in 1979, by then I started telling the whole world I wanted to be a missionary and a pastor. <laughs> and that was still the 70s. So there were a number of people who, um, you know, t including one of my grandmothers told me, you shouldn't do that. Women will just take away jobs from men. Um, and, but I, I was around my parents at church all the time, and I knew there was plenty of work to do at church that nobody wanted to do. So I would just say, if people press me on it, I'll just do whatever others don't want to do. I don't care. I just want to, I want to be, I want to be sharing Jesus. Um, so then, um, thank God I got to go to um, college, seminary, and then my, I got to have a first call here in Chicago. I pastored Zion Cristo Rey Lutheran Church. Um, and then um, our, our babies came. It was time for Christian. He was finishing his seminary to take his first call. And um, he was called by the bishops to California. Um, uh, they, they needed a bilingual pastor in California. So the whole family, we had to move to California. Um, and we, um, he pastored out there. Um, and um, I was helping when our kids were very small. And then eventually I, I got to help uh, a neighboring church start uh, more outreach and worship services in Spanish, a new worshiping community in Spanish. And then you all called uh, uh, Christian the pilgrim. There's Renee right there, the head of the call committee. And so then we all, we moved back to Chicago. Um, and, but then something that happened to me when we moved back to Chicago was that um, a number of churches uh, including the one that I had originally served, um, was not given another pastor after me. And another a number of churches in the area that we had been serving and my, my pastor's Bible study um, had been closed um, in Humble Park and Logan Square. And then a, a, a number more throughout the city. And this was very, very upsetting to me. <laughs> um, uh, to me, I mean, I never want any church to close, and um, and especially you know churches in a city um, like Chicago. You know, coming back to Chicago, um, you got this beautiful freshwater, huge Great Lake. I believe there will be people living in the Chicago area as long as there are people on the planet. Um, the city of Chicago, you know, will will keep having people flocking to it. And especially here in the city limits, I, I have this deep sense that I do not want us to lose our mission lighthouses in the city. You know, if a church closes and the property is sold, how are we going to get that back? Not very easily, you know. And um, so um, this was one of those things in life that um, there's a psalm about it. Well, I kept my mouth sh shut, my bones were withering away. <laughs> so finally... I, our national church is here in Chicago, and we know a number of pastors and leaders there. And finally, I went to the national church, and I um, I met with one of my mentors, um, Pastor Ruben Duran, and I told him, I will work as a volunteer for free at least one day a week if I can learn more about how to help churches not close. Um, and so at first I started volunteering, then working part-time, and now eventually I'm part of our ELCA um, Congregational Vitality team. And um, I have a little slideshow to show you about it um, uh, because it's right here. And I would I wish I could take you on a real tour, but I'm gonna try to screen share right now. And okay, I'm gonna share this. Okay, can you see this? Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. And let me just see. I want to still be able to see you, uh, but I, I guess I can't see your face. Okay. So, um, okay. So uh, my, my role is working as the associate director of our ELCA's congregational vitality team. Um, okay. Is this, okay. There we go. And something I would like to ponder um, if, if, if you could ponder this during this presentation, again, what part do I feel inspired to pray for? And if Jesus called me to be part of helping new churches be born today, what branch of new churches would I love to join? Just, just dreaming. What would you love to, to dive into um, or tell other people about? Okay, just for an overall big picture, um, as the ELCA, we have 65 synods or bishops across all 50 states and parts of the Caribbean. We are 9,300 congregations. And since we organized in 1988, you know, um, 519 have organized and joined us. And that's part of my work too, to help churches that are missions or new starts organize and join. We currently have 383 under development and we have approved, I got to be part of this since you called uh, Christian in about two, 2012, I've gotten to be part of saying yes to 343 new starts. And then every year we work for the training of at least a thousand or more leaders. Um, there, that's a spread of some of the, the 383 new starts. Um, and our offices are right here. If you take 90 and you get off right before O'Hare on Cumberland, you'll be right practically in the offices. After, But since the pandemic, this has been happening, um, at my part of the team, through your parsonage. Um, so part of the churchwide office is in your parsonage. Uh, but afterward, um, when the pandemic is over, come visit. I will be happy to give you a tour or take you to lunch. Um, and then this is gonna be very brief right now. For, new, for the work of the Congregational Vitality Team, we have um, five main parts and we've had a sixth part added recently. I'm especially responsible as the program director for three of these parts. New Starts, which is starting the new worshiping communities, strategic ministries, working for renewal um, with churches in ethnic communities and communities experiencing poverty and raising up leaders. These, these churches are huge uh, contributors of all the leaders in the church and creativity. Vulnerable congregations has been added since the pandemic. Um, a, a lot of especially strategic congregations have ex been hit extremely hard in the pandemic. Some churches have had almost everyone lose their jobs. Um, and many communities do not have uh, um, it, where, where there's low resources in um, communities in the United States, maybe do not have good internet for kids to be online for school. So a lot of churches are involved in that um, and involved in other life-saving ways with people just having enough to eat. Um, okay, Holy Innovations is another area of the church that I'm responsible um, for coordinating. It is for multi-synod projects um, where we're getting to do creative work, especially in um, having lay evangelists um, and working in, um, um, well, there's more to say, but I can't, I, uh, all right. And then Synod Vitality Strategies is helping every synod um, come up with strategies and coaching for the renewal of as many churches as possible in, in each synod. Um, Anchor Churches is supporting churches who are willing to partner strategically to raise up other existing churches. All right. All right, so now let's go back to new starts, which is um, what it, this is mostly about today, um, how new congregations are born. Um, one of the ways is congregational vitality trainings. I'm responsible to help coordinate um, trainings. Uh, right now we're all online, but usually we've been gathering together with about 350 people twice a year across the country. Um, here is a little um, a four minute, uh, you get to fly to, uh, this is a training that we had last year in San Diego in February. Let's see if we can get this to 
Hello, I am Pastor Ruben Duran, Director for Congregational Vitality in the ELCA. Uh, we've been enjoying a time here in San Diego at a Vitality Conference. 380 people from all over the country and from an amazing diversity are sharing with one another some uh, experiences of um, vitality, the work of God in our communities. So come and see. The peace is not the absence of discomfort. Peace is not the absence of discomfort. Sometimes for peace sake, we use that as an excuse to avoid conversations that are hard. God is calling us in this time, in this moment, in this place, to something new. When I think about congregational vitality, I think of questions. And I think of what questions I should be asking and what questions I should not be asking. And one of the questions that I realize I should not be asking is if by developing a new community, my heart will be broken or not. It's the wrong question. I think the right question is, how will your heart be broken? Will your heart be broken shut, or will it be broken open? Building beloved community, uh, how do we, uh, as, as predominantly black congregations, how do we, how do we talk about uh, ethnic diversity from the perspective of people of color? Vitality throughout our church is showing up when we are clear that we are the church, that we are a gift of grace, and that we together are on the move because God is on the move in and through us. And I think it's so important that when we're doing one-on-ones, we're also social justice informed and we're also incredibly trauma informed and also culturally informed. It's so important as we're going out in the community. And I loved hearing that in different ways and in different classes by different leaders. This Congregational Vitality event has expanded my ideas around ways that the church can adapt to the needs of the community and uh, combine nonprofit ministry with church ministry. I'm excited and I'm, I'm glad I came and, uh, and I know it's the work of the Holy Spirit and I thank God. Hello siblings uh, in Christ, I'm delighted to uh, add to the stories you heard that God is doing a new thing. It's like a um, new shoot out of an old stump. And by gathering together, uh, we're actually seeing almost like a nursery of new congregations, people that are experiencing the vitality of God to be able to serve the world with love and with the grace of God. Let me show you. Come here to the nursery. Come here, come here. Look at this. Right here. Brand new churches in the ELCA. What do you have to say? We are church together. That's right. Thanks be to God. Excellent. Okay. Let's see here. Everybody's still there, right? Yes. Um, okay. Um, with New Starts, uh, the, the, we work with every synod and the director for evangelical mission in every synod. And then the leaders of the synod bring proposals for where people want to start churches. And, and lately in these past couple of years, this is the breakdown of the ethnicity of people who want to start churches. And as you can see, it's a very multicultural uh, group of people who are on fire to start churches um, in, the, in the United States and in the Lutheran church. Um, and then 
um, the other uh, beautiful uh, task and, and mission that we get to do is to bring together people and leaders who are passionate about starting churches, who help people who want to plant churches, and also create a community to help the church planters not to give up, but to keep going. Um, and, and to help look for where churches can be planted across the country. And this is very exciting. These are some of the different um, cohorts of leaders um, that we have um, been partnering to put together and to do the work with. So these are, our, these are all Lutheran leaders, African uh, descent churches, African national churches, and uh, many, some of these leaders live in Chicago, could come to Pilgrim to, to talk more about uh, what's happening and, and how this takes place. Um, Arab Middle Eastern churches. And this is the first Palestinian um, Lutheran woman to be ordained in the entire world who was just ordained a couple of years ago um, here in the Midwest um, in the Lutheran church. Asian churches, church launch. This is when there's a huge population growth somewhere in the country and the Lutheran church helps send a missionary to plant a new Lutheran church where there's this huge population growth. Um, then churches starting churches. Here you see um, the pastor in black doing the baptizing is Pastor Fred Nelson um, from Redeemer Lutheran Church here in Chicago in Park Ridge. And Redeemer Lutheran Church was actually planted by um, Pilgrim in 1931. Um, Bob told me that before people came on. And, uh, and this church has planted two more churches in Chicago and has been helping us train churches, how churches can plant churches. And it's really a beautiful thing um, that every church has the Holy Spirit and is able to plant churches. And it's a way of spinning off more life and continuing the growth uh, in, in church life. Um, uh, I mean, I, I just want to say about that too. Sometimes it seems counterintuitive to give away some people and funds for a church to start, but it actually contributes to the life of a healthy church. You know, without continuing to do a bunch of missions, sometimes the life cycle of church can just like a human life go up and down. Um, but this is what we found that churches that multiply churches uh, get filled with so much life, even from the to the mother church. Um, multicultural churches are churches that are intentionally multicultural from the beginning. This is a church in New York City um, that is also how uh, created um, a, a shelter for um, runaway youth uh, in the in the queer community who've been rejected by their families. Um, and it's an amazing life giving ministry. This is another multicultural, multicultural church based in San Diego, California. Postmodern churches, these are especially for the whole huge set of our population that may have kind of um, grown away from church or rejected church or felt hurt by church. And so they do church kind of in a non-traditional way, which, you know, around Pilgrim, there's tons of 20s and 30s some pe year old people that are not currently in church. And this would be the kind of church to reach that kind of group of people. Um, poverty justice, homeless justice ministries. These are ministries that are very much like our hot meal, but where the, the pastor and the ministry's whole time is focused on the, the um, homeless population or, or populations of people in extreme poverty. Prison congregations, uh, Lutheran, um, this is a huge place for, for different um, denominations uh, to have huge response to church ministry. Um, and the Lutheran expression in prisons is very special because a lot, there's a lot of fire and brimstone preaching in prisons, but the Lutheran preaching is grace-filled. Um, and last year, one of our prison ministries had over 200 baptisms. Um, and then there's recovery churches is when a church partners with a 12-step ministry, a recovery ministry that wants to not only have recovery meetings, but also have a time even once a month where people can worship God as part in, in with it during this recovery journey. Re-entry churches are churches that get involved with people coming out of prison and re-entering civilian and um, you know, everyday life and having a place to belong which makes people not want to have to go back to prison to belong. 
Um, there are great examples of this, um, very active here in Chicago. Uh, this is our most uh, developed group. It's called the Ecumenical Network for the Development of Latinx Churches. And it involves uh, partnering <coughs> with other denominations and it's starting so many churches and it has a coaching network and it helps people go from lay ministry, college, seminary. This is an incredible network. Uh, online worshiping communities. Almost every church is doing online worship right now, but there is some work being done to through online to reach even more people who beyond the traditional people that have been in the church already and to help in synods uh, equip churches where they don't have the online capacity or a pastor who's able to you know, work on technology um, to develop things so that um, churches can have a broader online outreach. Wild Church is one that has been developing even more during the pandemic. It is churches um, who meet outside and maybe do a hike or something as part of the worship service. Um, this is very popular in a younger generation uh, church. So again, what part of this do you feel inspired to pray for? And if you just picked right now that Jesus said to you, one of the, we want you to set out two by two and just do one of these things, what was something that you would dive into? And um, so let me just stop sharing here and so I could see people's faces more. Okay, well, this is my, one of my favorite books that has helped me to not give up in Christian ministry. And it's actually more like a booklet and we use it for new members a lot of times. It's called a Baptized We Live, Lutheranism as a Way of Life. And um, at one point I, I got really depressed about my life at the end, even right at the end of seminary, like people spent so much money on me, uh, you know, all this education from my parents and all these people teaching me, how on earth am I ever gonna do anything that proves this was all worth it? And I mean, but that's not the way to go about things. Um, we. Uh, God has already said we're worth it. You know, he grabbed, and when we're baptized, Jesus takes everything about us and gives us everything about Jesus Christ and grafts us into the tree of Christ. And, um, and we're just meant to flow with the love of Christ. And um, so that's like this branch with the flowing from the deep roots of Christ, what we do in life, we're free. We're, we've been set free and we're just meant to do what we can and trust in Christ. So, um, and so we can take a risk with these, you know, um, baby new start churches and everything else we're called to do. And I would just like us to read this. Um, could we read this out loud? And we'll just say a prayer. If you could say it out loud with me. We're children of God, priests of the King, disciples of Christ, a servant people, a holy nation, the communion of saints, the followers of the way, proclaimers of the wonderful deeds of God. Jesus' story becomes our story. Baptized into Jesus' death, we're raised to live as the body of Christ in the world today. Jesus, we thank you so much that you've called us uh, even before we're born and that you've woven our lives together in your church and that you've made us Pilgrim Lutheran Church. And we thank you for your unending rivers of love, forgiveness, grace, power, inspiration. And we thank you for sending us out in the world to be hands and feet of yours, uh, to pass out your love, to share your love, to share your word. We pray for all the new churches that your Holy Spirit starts. And we pray um, that every church is, is continually filled with your grace, that the leaders are filled with your, your bravery, uh, your peace that passes understanding, and uh, your determination that there are more people to reach and embrace. And uh, we pray for every leader of New Starts. We pray for every leader in the entire church and every member. Uh, use us, God. We're in your hands. And thank you that you've promised that the things you, you call us to do, you're the one who finishes the work. We pray with you, Jesus, for every uh, concern and person on the hearts of people today. And we pray with you the prayer you always pray with us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.